Well, it's just really good to see all of you here. It's been nine years, I think, since we've been back uh, to President's Weekend. Um, so it's kind of nice. I think we'll probably be coming again every year now since we now are moved back to Missouri. And uh, so we, we're enjoying it. We're at least by our family, close to our family and friends, and be able to see all of you again, which is really, really nice. But I want to start out and ask is, what is a hero? And maybe you all have an idea in your mind that you're thinking about as far as a hero. Um, I know some of the things that I think about are are not the Superman, Batman, um, Spider-Man, those kind of things, right? And they're, they're heroes. A lot of our young kids like to watch those movies, and maybe you have as well. But I look at a hero as being someone who shows courage, which, again, they do, right? They show those things. Um, selflessness. And along with selflessness, a determination to face, I think, in our lives, adversity. And so when we think about those attributes, when we think about those heroes and what a hero is in your mind and what it should mean to us, um, we have to look at that and say, okay, it doesn't matter if we're a man or a woman, does it? Because we have women heroes as well, don't we? And again, I'm not going to cover those heroes, at least the heroes of this world. Um, I may cover a little, a few heroes in my seminar uh, through the Bible, um, but I'm not going to be specific to a hero at this point. Um, because whether you're a man or a woman, in all of your righteousness, right, and everything that you do, there's a common denominator that we need to remember in, in our lives, a common denominator that brings what we call these heroes of the Bible together. And that is that they made themselves available, right? They kept themselves available to God for God to use them. Okay, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, each and every one of us, and each and every one of these heroes that we talk about, that we're looking at, come into a relationship with a loving, caring father. And so everyday heroes, again, as I mentioned earlier, may not be those who wear capes, those who have these supernatural powers and abilities that we look at, the world looks at, but there's one extraordinary equality about them. And it's a steadfast faith. Okay, these heroes we're talking about are these, a steadfast faith that permeates their daily lives. Right? It's encompassed in their lives. Everything is about their lives. It's examples in their lives. And when we think about that, and we think about this permeating our lives... We also have to realize that this world is ever-changing, isn't it? And there's something that I believe that the Bible describes, and we're going to look at that, as a problem. And again, this problem is something that's been there for a long, long time. This problem is something that's occurred over and over again. And we know that this problem gets worse over time. So I want to begin in Proverbs chapter 22, or sorry, Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs 29 and verse 18. Because as I mentioned, you know this road that we're walking now, this life is hard. Anybody that doesn't think it is, please raise your hands. This life is hard. Being a kid is hard. If you were to ask a couple of kids that are in here. Being a teenager is hard. Being an adult is hard. Being married is hard. Being single is hard. Right? All these are hard. Getting old is hard. And I think we all understand that. Life is hard. And when life is difficult, you all know this, when it's difficult, we tend to get our minds off of what is really important. All right? When life becomes difficult, everything going on in our lives, what's really important goes to the back burner, doesn't it? So here in Proverbs 29, verse 18, it says, where there is no revelation. And if you look at that in the, in the King James, it says vision. Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. Well, that's this world now, isn't it? There's no restraint on anything. We, it's, you're happy to do whatever you want, whenever you want, with whoever you want. There's no restraint in this world. But it says, happy is he who keeps the law. So the Bible speaks in terms of what being able for us to look into the future. Right? That's what we're supposed to be doing. Looking into the future, being able to look towards the kingdom of God and willing to sacrifice 
our lives for the kingdom of God. Hey, that's what our God expects from us. That's our responsibility is us for us to do. But you know what? When you think about that, how do we do that? Because we're supposed to, as we just talked about, sacrifice our lives for something we have never experienced yet because we haven't experienced the kingdom, have we? We haven't. But that's in the future. It's something that we're supposed to be looking to in the future. And yet God calls upon us in, every day, in our everyday lives to sacrifice everything for his kingdom. Everything in our lives. And so we look at a hero, and I'm going to use hero faith. They can see it. They can understand it. right? They can envision what that is supposed to be like. God's kingdom. And it takes faith to know and understand that this world is failing. This world is falling apart quicker and quicker every single day with things that are happening. But we know that there's a new world to come. Right? We don't look at the now. We look at the future. The world to come. What God is giving to us. You know that, and you probably knew this and understand this, but actually uh, Christ um, on seven, at least seven occasions told the disciples or said to the disciples and used the term little faith. Oh, you of little faith. And he, again, I think about that and I say, why was he telling them that? Why was he saying, oh, you of little faith? Well, because they only saw where they were standing. They only saw the now. And that's where we are right now, isn't it? We see the now. We see what our lives are now. And that's all we're, where we're at. But Christ was saying they couldn't look beyond that. Right? They couldn't look beyond to the future. They couldn't look beyond to what God was offering them. And even after Christ explained the kingdom to them. I mean, I think about Israel and everything they went through. How would you not have faith in all those things they went through? When they experienced those things, they saw them firsthand. They were there. And yet they couldn't see it. It was only where they were at the time. And God calls us to come past that. You know, in, in Matthew, I guess that's where I was going to say it. You don't have to turn it there. But in Matthew, it talks about Christ actually um, showed them the vision. Right? He gave them a vision of that transfiguration. They saw it firsthand. They saw that. Again, it was a vision, but they still could not envision in that. They still couldn't see it. They couldn't move past that and what that was going to be like. I mean, think about what we have today, what God has given us. Again, we have to have faith, don't we, that to know what God has, has promised us, to know what God is actually giving to us. We have to have faith to move past that and to look beyond the now and look beyond to the future. I want to give an example here in Luke. We're going to look at Simon Peter. Simon Peter here, Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. Again, just an example of Simon Peter. And it says here, and look, and, uh, sorry, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever thought about that? Put your name in there. Mark, Mark, Satan has asked for you. That's a, very, a terrifying thought in my mind. Because I'm wondering, why would he be asking for me? Right? Why? Well, first of all, because Satan could not have him unless God allowed it. Right? We think about that. He wouldn't allow God. Remember with Job. Satan wanted to do something with Job, and God restrained him, wouldn't let him, until he let him say, okay, go ahead and do these things to Job. And he did all those horrible things to him and his family. So Satan is there, present, looking for us. And I would dare say, don't think that he's not asking for you. It may not be in this sense. But he is there, very powerful, looking how he can change and move you to a different direction. 
There's a different way that you, he wants you to go instead of what we should go. Well, then you get to the end of that, that verse, and it says that he may sift you as wheat. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, Satan wanted to try him, right? Satan wanted to sift him. Satan wanted to make him worry, give him doubts, give him fears, give him all those things. We are all in that same boat. Right? He gives us those fears and doubts in our lives all the time. That's why this faith is so important for all of us. He goes on here in verse 32. This is Christ talking to Peter. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen the brethren. So right here, there's an implication that Peter was going to take a wrong turn, which he did. Right? He did. He took a wrong turn. But you know what? Christ knew that he would return. He knew he would return because he said, when you come back, strengthen your brethren. Strengthen them. So I want you to realize something here. Christ did not pray that you don't die. Christ did not pray that you don't get sick. Now I want you to think about this in your lives. Christ prayed what? That your faith should not fail. Right? Your faith should not fail. And I think sometimes in our own human nature, we think of faith as being something that can protect us from anything that's going on around us, right? Can protect us from something bad happening. You know, as a young kid, I remember thinking to myself, growing up in the Worldwide Church of God, I thought, man, you never heard about people getting sick. You never heard about people getting cancer. You never heard about, and that was years and years ago, of course. But you never heard about that. And in my mind, as a, as a young kid, it's like, wow, this faith in the church is something. It protects us. And sometimes it, maybe we think that way. We think that if we have faith, nothing bad happens. And if something does happen, that we are lacking in faith. But you know what? The Bible doesn't support that. It doesn't. Something bad can happen to people with great deals of faith. Right? Something bad can happen. Something, you know, people can die who have a great deal of faith. You know, there was a time, I look back, a time in when I remember, and maybe a time when you remember, when the church, I was going to say, was pretty judgmental. And maybe we've always been that way. Maybe that's just a part of the church. Maybe that's just what we have, a part of our human nature. Being judgmental. You know, thinking, you know, what are you doing wrong for that to happen? What are you doing wrong for that to happen? You know, if they had faith, that wouldn't, they wouldn't be failing in that way. You know, and I, I bring that up because it's very ingrained in my head. Because when my son died 11 years ago, somebody actually said that to me. What did you do for him to die? That's not the way God operates. That's not how God looks at things. It has nothing to do with our faith. There's a time and a place for everything. And we just have to realize that and go through with it. But those are things, people were very judgmental. And that's something God want, doesn't want us to be. He doesn't, we have to look beyond that. We have to look because you know what? Sometimes things happen to someone. Things happen to people and we don't know why. And we, we may never know why. It's just a part of life. But some of the most faithful people, some of the most truthful the servants that we know of, these heroes, have died in the faith. And some of them very young. And we just have to know that your length of life or your lack of trials does not qualify you or me or anyone to be a hero of faith. It doesn't. I think it's something entirely different that we look at. Let's go to Luke. We're in Luke. Just turn back a few chapters to chapter 18. Chapter 18, because... Christ makes the statement here, Luke chapter 18 and verse 7. 
And, and he says, And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? God doesn't answer sometimes. At least not when we want him to. I guess I should say that. He doesn't answer sometimes. And he doesn't, he doesn't answer right away. That's maybe a better way to say that. But he bears long with us. Right? He bears long. He's there with us all the time. Verse 8 goes on to say, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will really, will, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, some people have looked at that verse and they've actually come to the conclusion that he won't find faith on the earth. But it's a question, isn't it? It's a question here. It doesn't have to be true. The implication is that in the end time, it's going to be harder and harder. The world we're in now is getting harder and harder. That's something we are experiencing in this life. Will he find faith on the earth? Heroes of faith are those that are faithful. No matter what happens in their lives. Heroes of faith are those who withstand trial after trial after trial. And sometimes you get sick of the trial. Sometimes you're tired of the trials. You think, can you just, well, in some words, just leave me alone for a while? <laughs> can you let, let me catch my breath? Can you let me get my head above water instead of bobbing up and down all the time? It's tiring sometimes. But God knows what he's doing. God understands where you're at. He understands what you can handle and can't handle. He knows those things. But again, it's not a question. Or it is a question. It doesn't have to be a true question. Will God, will he find faith? You know, we are told that our faith is tested time and time again. And it will be until the end of time. Right? Our faith will be tested over and over and over. It is, it is being now. And the end time events that we're coming to will test our faith. Unto what we, where we really stand. We're, what we're going to do. And we will either become a hero of faith. Or we won't survive. It isn't a matter of one single event. One single moment of time. That's not what it's up to. It's not what it's about. Over the years, we've read many, you know, read many verses. We've all been in church a long time. We've gone through the Bible a lot, and we've all read a lot of verses describing the end time. And it's sometimes it's not a, a, a very uh, popular thing to, to look at to cover end time events. What's going to happen? What we're going to go through? It's not popular, but it's there. We know it's there. We know it's true. But in the end time, it's going to be a, a time of what? A lack of faithfulness. The lack of. It's going to be a time of the lack of trust. And we see that today. Who, I mean, I'll be admitted, I don't trust a lot of people. You know, I, I still know people who don't lock their doors in their house or their cars or anything. And I'm thinking, what? How can you? I've locked mine, I don't know, forever. Well, since I can drive. I just don't trust people. It's a lack of faith, a lack of confidence in God. Look at where we're at. In this world, a lack in the confidence of God doing what he said he will do for us in his kingdom. Again, that describes, of course, the world we live in. We live in a society that is so busy, and I was just talking earlier that I feel like I'm so busy all the time, going, traveling, doing my things. But we live in a, your, your lives are just as busy, working, school, whatever you're doing, and you're going all the time. And life is just so busy that you really have time to focus on the issue of faith. And that's, uh, you know, I say that, and I include myself in that, even as a pastor, even as the things I do is, you, you get busy in everything to, to focus on a certain area, to focus on what you, you truly do. And now, again, I focus on it pretty much daily. What am I doing? How am I doing it? And how, what is my example? But what it means to have faith. What does that mean to you when you look at that? What does it mean to me to have that faith? I mean, where is your faith? 
Good questions, I think, that we answer in this time. Where is our faith? How much faith do you have? What kind of faith does God expect from you? How do you and how do I become heroes of faith? And I, why do I ask that? Because we, we are to become heroes of faith. That's what God wants. Right? That's what God wants from each one of us. It's to become a hero of faith. Now we may not get our, as we'll see a little bit later here, we may not have our names written in the book. Mine is already. Lucky, Mark. <laughs> but we may not have our name written in the book. But we'll find out, does that matter? Does it matter? Let's go to Luke chapter 17. Back another chapter, Luke 17. Because the apostles are going to ask Christ for something. Luke chapter 17 and verse 5. I think probably something we've all prayed for and prayed about in our lives. Luke 17 verse 5 it says, And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. How do we become heroes of faith? How do we become people of faith? Well, the disciples here wanted more faith. right? They wanted that, and they didn't want to be lacking in it. And I think as God's people, as you and I sitting here today, we don't want to be lacking in it either, do we? We want to be strong in our faith. Going on to verse 6, it says here, So the Lord said... If you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you, having several, or having a servant plowing and tending sheep, would say to him, when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? He says, I think, I, I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all those things which you have commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what, you, what, done what was our duty to do. Hmm. Think about the lesson here. What he's talking about. Christ was saying... If you don't increase your faith, or if you don't want to increase your faith, sorry. If you don't want to increase your faith, go ahead, take care of all the responsibilities that you're already taking care of. Right? Do what you're, you do all the time. Keep the Sabbath day. Keep the commandments. But nothing more. All right, if you don't want to increase your faith, just do what you naturally do all the time. It was what, what he's trying to say here. And I think that's, that's something that we, you know, Christ said you, didn't, you wouldn't have faith here. Right? Christ said you wouldn't, it's not that you're not going to be a Christian. But what he is saying is that to become a hero of faith, to increase your faith, you must do more than is expected. More. Now, I know some that think just coming to church every Sabbath and coming to the Holy Days is, is enough. They're, doing, they're, they're, they're a good Christian. Well, I look at by these standards, no, it doesn't say that. You do more than is expected. More. And again, as I said, Christ didn't say we wouldn't have faith or we wouldn't be a Christian. I believe we all know where the Bible talks about faith. And the heroes of faith. I'm sure we all read through that many times. And there's no other chapter in the Bible that talks about faith. Or a hero of faith. And what we think that must be. And what we think that is. And what we know that is. You know, that's a foreign principle in society today, isn't it? Thinking about faith. Knowing what faith is. To give, it, to give more than it's expected. I mean, are you kidding? I have to give more? I'm already giving this much. I have to give more than that? But again, as a hero of faith, 
That's the way we have to think. Not just doing, you know, the daily things we do every day is increasing our faith. We do more than is expected. Anyway, well, you know that we're talking about Hebrews chapter 11. Right, Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. It tells a story of faith through people, right, through their lives, heroes of faith from the past, those who went through so many tremendous things that are think, very encouraging and uplifting to us. You know, we, have, we look at those, these heroes in chapter 11, and if you didn't realize it, there's two categories of these heroes in chapter 11. There are those named Enoch, right? Abel, Noah, Abraham, so on. They're named. They're there for us. But there's also a whole group listed with no name. But acknowledging that they existed as heroes. So, we don't have to be written in the book to be a hero. But God wants us to be heroes of faith. You look at this and there were those who were sawn in two. There were those that suffered trial by fire. They went through the things, these things and they developed faith. Because they are heroes of faith. They were heroes of faith back then. But in order for us to understand Hebrews 11, we need to go back one chapter to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 actually identifies the quality of a hero of faith. And Hebrews 11 names them. Okay, 10 describes the qualities of the heroes of faith, and chapter 11 names who they are. Hebrews chapter 10 is also the chapter where you find out what we need to do to become a hero of faith. And again, that's what this seminar is about, is we need to be heroes of faith. We need to become heroes of faith. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We'll begin in verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way which he consecrated for us, though the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in fullness, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. How do we become a hero of faith? Have a pure heart. Right? That's what it's talking about. Have a pure heart, or pureness of heart, and removing this evil conscience. It goes on to verse 23. It says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Look at the list there of doing more. That's how I look at it. Maybe we do some of those things right now. But doing more. I'm going to drop down to verse 30. Verse 34, we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spe spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became a companions of those who were treat so treated. When you came into the church, I'm going to say you suffered trials. You suffered trials and persecutions. And why I say that is because I know when my parents came to the church, as a young kid, I remember my dad losing jobs, um, family issues. I mean, there was all kinds of things. Persecuted for coming into the church. And you were reproached by your family, maybe. I know I couldn't see my grandma for almost eight months because of that stupid church. Those stupid beliefs. 
and you became compan but you became companions. Think about this to those who are also reproached. So we came to church together, and we had like minds, things that happened to all of us, right? Things that we all went through. And it tells us here that we're supposed to reflect back, right? Reflect back on what that was like. Do you remember that? As a young kid, I still remember some of those things that happened that my parents went through for coming into this church, into God's church. But we're supposed to reflect back on that, back on what it was like, and compare it to what we have now, what this life is today. Would you do the same thing? All right, think back to then. Would you do the same thing and go through the same things today? Would you make the same sacrifices today? Would you stand as a hero of faith or would you not? You know, it's interesting to me that many of us came into the church years ago. And I'm gonna, hopefully when I say this, it doesn't sound bad. <laughs> I'm prefacing it right away. But when we came to the church years ago, we probably had more faith. I want you to think about that just for a moment. I'm not saying they did or people did. I'm saying we probably did have more faith. Or some would say maybe ignorance. But you would do things because God said to do them. All right, you did things because God said that's what you're supposed to do. It didn't matter what else happened around you. It didn't matter what else was going on around you. God said this is what you're going to do and you do it. And you didn't worry about the consequences. Is, this, is that what it's like today? I mean, I hope so. That's what it should be like today. But I see, there's a, and I know that, you know, over the years things have changed. I get that. We live in a different society than we lived at 20, 30, 40 years ago. I know that. But is it the same for us? Would we do those same things? Here we are, 25, 30, 40, 50 years later, And would we still do that? I'm not talking about making foolish mistakes. We've all done that <laughs> in our lives. We've all made those mistakes. But it's, it's the heart, isn't it? It's the heart. It's the attitude, I think, that we have to look at when we talk about these things. The heart and the attitude. It's not the same today as it was back then. Now, again, church was much different back then. Back then it was strict, you do this, you do that, and that was it, right? And we all obeyed. Again, as times change, those things also change. So there's been a change in, in things that go on. But again, we're talking about the heart. We're talking about our attitude. Do we want to grow in faith? Do we want to increase our faith? We have to do more than is expected of us. Verse 34 goes on to say, For you had compassion on me in chains in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven so it says you gave your possessions joyfully right you gave and i don't know about you but that's hard to do sometimes to joyfully give joyfully give your possessions I'm not talking about things either. I'm talking about, you know, your love, your concern, your everything, giving those things. It's not easy all the time to do that. It seems like when you get more possessions, it seems like the harder and harder it gets, doesn't it? But you said you joyfully did that because you know, right? You, you know and you have possession in heaven. Right, that's all we already know that. We have faith in that. You look for, to a better world because you're a hero of faith. Verse 35, it says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have a need of endurance. Right? Keep on keeping on. Keep on moving forward. So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. And then you go back to chapter 11. Right, you go back 
and you find these stories of these people of faith, these heroes of faith, this is what they were like. Right? This is what they were like. You compare that to what you find in chapter 10. You find that a hero of faith is someone who is a pure of heart. Right? Not looking out for self. Always somebody else. Always giving, us, giving of yourself. Is someone who holds fast to what he believes. Not wavering. It's this individual, I think, who considers himself to provoke others. Right? To provoke others to love and good works. That's a challenge. That's a challenge for all of us. Again, call to remember, remembrance the former days. Reflect back on what you were like when God called you. Do you remember the fire that you had, the zeal that you had? Look at those former days. Walk by faith, not by sight. So those are the things that lead us then to chapter 11. Right? Those are the things that bring us to this part where we find these heroes that we look to, that I think sometimes we admire for what they went through and did for their faith. And again, those heroes are divided into two parts. As I mentioned earlier, the well-known names that we go through and you can read through and, and look at that were heroes of faith. But then the last part of the chapter, you see those who have... No names. Individuals by no name. Let's look at verse 30. Verse 30 in chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. It says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled after seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe, but when she had received the spies with peace. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms. These are the people we know with names, who've done these marvelous things, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong became valiant in battle, turned to fight the enemies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. And then we go, to a different, we go a different direction in the story. These were all the people who did great things. And great things happened to them. But there's a category of heroes who suffered greatly. Continuing in verse 35, others were tortured not accepting the deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. You talk about real heroes. I mean, look at these people. Look, look at what they went through, what they did. Who laid it all on the line. These are the others. These are the nameless Faceless people who have given their lives over the years for the truth of God, for the kingdom of God. These are heroes of faith. And we often operate under the premise, you know, I keep God's law. I'm a person of faith. Therefore, everything is going to turn out right. Everything is going to go right. And it will turn out right. Probably. Probably. These people felt the same way. These people we just read about felt the same way, but God allowed this to happen to them. Verse 39, it goes on to say, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So God has a plan, which all these individuals that we just read about here, 
in this chapter, all these heroes of faith at that time, all of the heroes of faith in our day, all of us and all of them will receive the reward at the same time. The reward, again, is the kingdom of God. To be in God's family, to be a part of that family. So the subject of being a hero of faith is something that's very important. It should be very important to all of us today. Not just having faith, but being a hero of faith. Again, going above and beyond. Doing more than is expected of us. And at the end time approaches, there is going to be less and less faith. That's why this is so important. There will be less and less faith. Christ only asked the question. Right? He only asked that question. He didn't say it would have to be that way. I'd like to conclude. I'm probably a little early, but that's okay. Maybe I'll end right on time. I want to conclude with a story about faith. And I think it's something that when you think about this, this is what's required of you and me. And God wants us to do this. And I don't remember who gave me this story, who told me the story. I think it was a good friend and an uh, older pastor, of, uh, used to be, uh, but Mr. Richard Pinelli. Um, he gave a lot of stories. And I think this, I think this was from him, but I'm not positive. It says an old timer by the name of Desert Pete had blazed a trail through the desert. He had actually lived in the desert for much of his life. And before he died, he dug a well in the middle of the desert, deep enough to reach the water table. He put an old hand pump on the well and left a message for anyone who came by as to what they should do. Well, lo and behold, a man comes by who is dying of thirst. And sitting beside the well is a jug of water and a note from Desert Pete. It says, there's enough water in the jug to prime the pump, but not enough if you drink some first. This well has never gone dry, even in the worst of times. Pour the water into the top of the pump and pump the handle very quickly. After you have drank, uh, had a drink, then refill the jug for the next man who comes along behind you. If you drink the water, you may survive, but no one else behind you will. The subject of faith and being a hero of faith is very similar to that story. You and I can choose to drink the water now. Again, that's a choice that we all can make, or we can prime the pump. Let me put it to you another way. You can look to the kingdom of God. We can look to the future. We can look to what God has in store for us. Or you can do what you want right here and now. We have a choice. And we have that choice all the time, don't we? We have that choice. We're not forced to do anything in our lives. Faith is a matter of the future. Looking to the future. Faith is something that carries you into the future. And faith is what you and I must live on and live through in this life. We must be those who are faithful to God in everything that we do. Everything that we do. Christ warned us that in the end times, faith would waver. Right? Faith would waver. He warned us that we, would, we need to build our faith. We need to add to our faith and build more faith as time goes on. But in order to do that, we have to be doing more than ex is expected. He warned us that it will be easy to fall away as it gets closer to the return of Jesus Christ. So we think about these things. We look at these heroes of faith. We look at to what we've just read today and what things that we need to be doing. Heroes of faith are those who don't do one good heroic, heroic deed. Because if you only do one, then you're not doing more than is expected. Right? You do more than one. Heroes of faith are those who stand the test. Right? They're there 
all the time, the Sabbath, week after week, year after year. They're there. They're doing more. They're serving. They're helping. They are the glue that holds the church together. And I think we look at this and we can say we certainly owe, at least when I look at this, we owe those from the past a great deal of thanks. A great deal of appreciation for what they stood for. You know, you and I don't know, but maybe we'll be brought up at some time. Maybe somebody will talk about us about some time. About how we were heroes of faith. And maybe we, our names won't be written in the book, as I mentioned before. It doesn't have to be. But it's the example that we set for all everybody around us. What we stand for. Hopefully we're a part of those. Hopefully we are. What does God want? You know, it's a, this, this weekend is about heroes. What does God want? What does he want from us? We are to be those heroes of faith. 